Starting in 1977, General Motors embarked on what I call the Great Downsizing Epoch. A massive undertaking for General Motors that by 1986 resulted in every one of their automobile lines being substantially downsized. Some of their lines zapped with the old shrink ray more than once. It was done, ostensibly, to make more fuel-efficient vehicles so GM could be in compliance with ever stricter government-mandated fuel economy standards. Fuel economy standards in response to elevated fuel prices stemming from the OPEC oil embargo of October 1973 through March of 1974. Now, much has been said about how successful General Motors was in downsizing their full-size cars in 1977. Additionally, much has been said about how horrible a job they did with their smaller, compact cars in 1980. Conversely, much less has been said over the years, good, bad, or indifferent, with regards to their downsize intermediates that debuted for model year 1978. That included the Buick Century and Regal, Chevrolet Malibu and Monte Carlo, Pontiac Grand Am, Grand Prix, and Le Mans, the Le Mans known as the Bonneville, from 1982 through 1986, and lastly, but certainly not leastly, the Oldsmobile Cutlass. All right, so let's cut to the chase as we all have things to do. While I'm ambivalent at best towards GM's 1977 full-size cars, I take much exception with their intermediates or mid-size cars introduced for 1978. Why? Well, for a number of reasons, but let's start with the most superficial. I'm just not a fan of the way they look. My dad had a 1980 Buick Century. There he is in front of our house back on Long Island. Yeah, he's wearing a fedora. So I know a thing or two about these cars. Both the Century and Oldsmobile Cutlass were restyled for 1980. More on that in a minute or two. But it still didn't make for, in my opinion, cars that were anywhere near as handsome as the ones they replaced. Aesthetically, somehow, in some way, these three box sedans appear smaller than they actually are. And that's because they're too narrow in relation to how wide and tall they are. To me, even the best of them look stubby and incomplete. I get that they were engineered first and designed second, but remarkably, they're all but as long as a 1955 Chevrolet. And nobody has ever called a 55 Chevy stubby. The big difference is the 55 Chevy rides on a wheelbase a whopping 7 inches long. Longer. I also found the interior of my father's Buick, despite what people say, cramped, chintzy, and the dashboard layout clumsy. My dad's car broke down constantly, too, and the silver paint oxidized and turned a strange, dull white. What's more, with its 110 horsepower, 3.8 liter V6, it was slow. Like taking the dark side of 15 seconds to accelerate from 0 to 60? Slow? One last thing, the rear windows didn't roll down. Ah, great fun whenever mom would fire up one of her camels. The upside was that little car handled fairly well, could get into and out of tight parking spaces pretty easily, and it did get better gas mileage than the 3 mile per gallon 1972 Cadillac sedan to fill it replaced. That table set, let's take a moment and take a look at GM's 1978 to 1988 intermediates and work backwards from least, um, bad to what I believe is the absolute worst of them all. Please note the following list is purely subjective, my opinion and my opinion only, tabulated by decades of exposure to these mediocre-looking cars. Do not eat if seal is broken. Void were prohibited. List does not cover misuse, accident, lightning, flood, tornado, tsunami, volcanic eruption, earthquakes, hurricanes, and other acts of God. Your opinion may vary. See dealer for details. So without any further ado, Maestro, hit the stage music and let's get at it. The least cringeworthy of all these cars are the refreshed specialty coupes that debuted for 1981. That would include the Buick Regal, Chevrolet Monte Carlo, Pontiac Grand Prix, and Oldsmobile Cutlass. I like the performance versions particularly. By 1986 and 1987, of all of these cars, with its turbocharged and intercooled V6, the Buick Grand National was the fastest accelerating car in America. Much faster, in fact, than the Corvette. If I had to choose, I'd take a Monte Carlo SS. Thank you very much. Just make sure it's not one of those Winston Cup Aero Coupe things. Tech Technically, Pontiac did make a performance version of the Grand Prix, although if you want to split pinstripes, you could say the 1986 only Grand Prix 2 plus 2 was, but it really wasn't. Next, we move on to, somewhat remarkably, the station wagons. From a functionality standpoint, although I'm not a fan of pickup trucks and SUVs, I appreciate their utility. And while I generally abhor four-door sedans, I do find charm in station wagons for some reason. To some degree, we're all idiosyncratic, right? Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, and Buick all made these mid-sized wagons from 1978 through 1983, and I'd be okay if one of these were in my garage. There's something to be said for something that's manageable and dutiful. Again, they ain't no lookers, but then again, most wheelbarrows aren't anything to write home about. I do draw the line at anything with that fake wood grain paneling on the sides. Us car guys have our standards. 
things get somewhat convoluted and go in different directions from here to the top or bottom of my list, that's because although they all use the same chassis, the four-door Chevrolet Malibu and Pontiac Le Mans use a different body than what was used on the four-door Buick Century, like my dad had, and the Oldsmobile Cutlass. So let's look at them separately in order of how awful I think they are. First, the Chevrolet Malibu and the Pontiac Le Mans. For a company that made its name on styling, yeah, engineering as well, but styling was key. The 1978 to 1983 Chevrolet Malibu and Pontiac Le Mans, again the Le Mans, became the Bonneville from 1982 through 1986. They might as well have been designed by a communist bloc automobile manufacturer. Same with my dad's century, but again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Talk about bland. These sedans are plain, dull, brown paper bag generic. They're toasted rice when you want rice krispies, fruit rings when you want fruit loops, Walmart brand flakes of corn when you want Tony the Tiger. Given the physical limitations of the platform, it's as if designers got depressed and gave up halfway through the project, executives greenlighting what they had completed because deadlines had to be hit. Hey, we've all been there. Worse was, just like with my dad's Buick, the rear windows and these things didn't roll down either. Allegedly, General Motors did research that found that drivers rarely roll down the rear windows when they didn't have rear passengers. Okay, probably true, but what do you do when you do have rear passengers? I get it saved weight and cost, and there was a scooch more rear hip room because the rear door panels were narrower, but the whole setup seemed weird. Now, before we get to the cake toppers in my garage of shame, let's circle back and wander back over to the coupe versions of these cars made before 1981, namely the 1978 to 1980 Pontiac Grand Prix and the biggest stinker of all the coupes, the 1978 to 1980 Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Starting with the Grand Prix, I know a great part of my distaste for this car has to do with how much of a fanboy I was of the car it replaced, that being the 1973 to 1977 Grand Prix, to say nothing of the 1969 to 1972 Grand Prix. Everything those cars were, these cars weren't, that being something truly special that went above and beyond simply being a two-door sedan. There's nothing out of the ordinary about these cars. They're rental car, fleet car generic, and any attempts they did make to make them different were offset, again, by the wonky dimensions that all of these cars, save for maybe the wagons to some degree, suffer from. Pontiac also offered a fancy-fied Le Mans two-door they called Grand Am from 1978 to 1980. That's not as bad as the Grand Prix. It's still not a handsome car, though. Pontiac also sold a four-door Grand Am from 1978 to 1980, just like they had sold a two- and four-door Grand Am from 1973 through 1975. Next to last on this list of indignity, we have the 1978 to 1980 Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Like the Grand Prix, much of my disdain for these cars stems from my unbridled hormone-drenched appreciation of the 1973 to 1977 Monte Carlos. Both the Grand Prix and Monte Carlo hearkening back to the classic cars of the 1930s and 1940s with their swoopy, oversized, outboard suitcase fenders. I get that these cars weren't for everyone, but they did become classics in their own right. And given how popular the 1973 to 1977 Monte Carlo was, you can't blame Chevrolet for trying to emulate them, but that's the problem with doing a throwback design. In this case, a throwback design of a throwback design. You're on the risk of creating something cartoonish. Giving stylists their due, though, they did exactly what they were tasked with. That was to create a 7-8 scale version of the 1973 to 1977 Monte Carlo. But unfortunately, what they came up with was something that resembled a matchbox car version of it rather than something fresh and unique. Some designs do look best on larger canvases, the inverse is true too, and granted some think the 1973 to 1977 Monte Carlo garish and over the top, but if it was going to work, and I think it did, it needs room to do so. Well friends, here we are at the top or bottom of my list of GM intermediates, and my golden toilet goes to Death Tim, please? Actually, two cars. The 1978 to 1980 Oldsmobile Cutlass Salon and 1978 to 1980 Buick Century Aero. Coupe. Or sedan. Or whatever they call it. I went back and forth with these cars in the Monte Carlo, but doing my best to look at these through my then adolescent goggles, I remember my thoughts about them first time I saw them, and they made me sad. I thought them so ugly I couldn't even look at them. Legend has it GM stylists were inspired by a design proposal that was likened to a European-style sedan with a fastback or hatchback design. Well, something got lost in translation. Once again, the problem was with the dimensional limitations of the platform. There was only so much that could be done. That's not even a hatchback. It's the trunk lid. Yeah, 
What were they thinking? And what stuff suit approved this? The end result was, surprise, surprise, cars that sold so poorly that GM scrapped the four-door design for 1980 for a far more conventional one that had much in common with the four-door Chevrolet Malibu and Pontiac Le Mans, if not the 1976 to 1979 Cadillac Seville. Oh, Buick and Oldsmobile kept the two-door around for 1980, but they deep-sixed it for 1981. Buick changed the name of the century to Regal in 1982, so they had a two-door and four-door Regal through 1984. Oldsmobile built their version through 1987. So there you have it, a brief rundown of the sad story that was GM Intermediates built starting in 1978, with some of them being built into the early part of the 1988 model year. Thanks for watching and feel free to comment below. Please like and subscribe too.